I'll be handling all the as a panel and chair everything. I'll take care of it. Okay. Let Pranav start. Okay. So I'm starting now. Okay. Thanks. Pranav, can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Start. So. I'm just wait. Just give me two minutes. Just give me two minutes to go yeah, live. Yeah. Once he says that we are live, then I'll start probably. So I got a call from Audhu. He says that uh, I need to introduce. Uh, I mean, just mention the speaker's name first, and then start my lecture. So we'll do so. That's okay. Okay, we are live. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online. Today's webinar is on cartilage 360 degrees, and uh, today's chairman is Dr. Krunal Shah, with uh, the expert panelist Dr. Nilesh and Dr. Sanjay Trivedi. So over to Dr. Krunal Shah. Uh, thank you, Nish. Thank you for that uh, uh, all technical support. And uh, I welcome you all, the viewers, for today's talk, today's uh, webinar on case-based discussion, uh, specifically cartilage 360. And I welcome all the speakers with me. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mani Tarora from Portis, uh, Chandigarh. And uh, I have uh, Drumil Patel from Baroda. We have Dr. Manoj Mehta from Baroda, Dr. Prathmesh Jain from Ahmedabad, and uh, we'll be missing Kalpesh by today for his uh, ill health. So with that, uh, I start my talk on the first talk. Uh, friends, uh, this is a case-based discussion, and this is the case which comes into my mind when whenever we discuss about the cartilage case, because this uh, really changed my concept about the cartilage defect. He was a 30 years old male, and if I give you a brief clinical profile of him, he is basically a, a, a farm trader. So if I explain you, he used to go to all the farms and uh, trade the, uh, the farm related uh, items to the farmers, uh, specifically in the villages. So what I mean to convey is he has to walk on an uneven surface day in day out for eight hours a day. And he was the only uh, earning member of his uh, family, basically coming from lower middle, uh, lower uh, socioeconomic class. There was actually no history of fall or trauma and uh, he had complaint of pain and swelling and locking in the knee since last uh, uh, 10 days. So uh, he also belongs to, uh, he also is a brother of one of the uh, general practitioner. When he came to me, came to me, he being a brother of a doctor, he was already been seen by three orthopedic surgeon and worked up. And what I noticed in a plain x-ray was this, there was some defect what, which I can appreciate on the lateral femoral condyle in the x-ray. And it was very uh, well shouting evident on the MRI. What I can appreciate is again a very huge defect on the lateral femoral condyle. And uh, usually this time, this is not the first time we are seeing this type of case. Lateral femoral condyle, most of the time it is in serious onset uh, uh, sort of osteonecrotic defect, not actually traumatic. So even in your cases, when you come into uh, come with uh, come to encounter this type of young fellows on the lateral femoral contact, most of them they do not have a very evident history of fall or trauma. Of course, when you inquire, they may give you some trivial trauma history, but majority of time it is a sort of self uh, osteonecrotic type of pathology. That's what uh, I I realized when I referred uh, the literature regarding this. So it was a huge defect. So now three things came into my mind. Uh, the options, what I should do was first is autologous chondrocyte implantation, then uh, osteochondral grafts, and the third is of course microfracture. Honestly speaking, my option or my first choice was ACI, the recent generation ACI. But uh, uh, the reason being, uh, it gives a homogeneous uh, type two collagen cartilage on uh, on the defect and he being the young active person probably can give a better result. 
uh, when I explained to him that he may need his reluctancy was he he was not willing to go for a two-stage procedure because uh, in ACI you need to take up the graft and then you have to send it to lab and probably then you have to do uh, open procedure. I am not very good in doing arthroscopic ACI uh, in this use defect, so do an open uh, ACI implantation. And the second thing was uh, again the cost. The cost being uh, basically in AC in in uh, uh, osteochondral grafts that is ports which I prefer uh, is uh, I can use that kit for two to three times though it, it is a disposable kit but usually my preference is to use two to three times so uh, the economy comes to third of the base of the of the charges of ACI if we consider as a whole. So he being a lower social media, lower middle uh, socioeconomic class, his preference for this two reason was to go for when I described all was osteochondral graft. Third micro fracture, anytime uh, not my option in this huge defect. Probably my fellow speaker will uh, throw more light on that. Uh, why? So uh, we can do both basically arthroscopic or open. I have tried both the case, both the ways. Uh, I did around eleven cases of both so far. Some of them initial. Uh, in my career for arthroscopic but honestly speaking I have shifted completely on the open one being uh, basically we do not get that trajectory in uh, in large cigars and in my hands I have seen some incongruency at the end of the procedure so no none of my patient had complained about those scars and uh, uh, I do most of the oats now uh, open so this was the intraoperative image. What you can notice is there was a huge defect. It was around three to three to four centimeter, and uh, uh, this is eighteen. This is eight millimeter uh, cigars which I have used in in the in the defect, and this is at the end picture of the procedure. Uh, one of the reasons doing ACI, we can sometimes use uh, this. There are, what you can notice of this locking problem is there is a huge loose body which, uh, which is appreciable in the, the lateral gutter. And sometimes we can remove it arthroscopically. We can send it to the lab and they can, uh, they can give us good result on that. So my rehab protocol is uh, I start ROM a third day. Uh, I kept him non wet bearing for three days, uh, at total three weeks, and then uh, third week I started to touch wet bearing and gradual partial to full wet bearing. I started after six weeks, and running is permitted after three months. These are some of the post op MRIs, and uh, I'm sorry, what I can appreciate is. Uh, the osteochondral graft has been very well taken up and uh, I can see a continuity signals into the cartilage of the native cartilage. So, and there is no, again, no uh, defect, which is appreciable. Basically, I wanted for this, for the presentation purpose, I tried to convince six of my patients doing a redo arthroscopy. Majority of them, I tried to convince doing free of charge and on their day of convenience for making a good presentation but honestly speaking this patient did not have any complaint and uh, they were not well, well convinced for uh, doing any type of procedure so that speaks about the results of this type of procedure and that uh, raises a very big question whether we are we are theoretically overdoing ACI or whether this type of osteochondral grafts or oats can be done in this huge defect and with good results specifically in our type of uh, Indian case scenario where uh, budget does matter about the surgery. So these are the uh, post-op MRIs. If I share the clinical results, uh, patient after six months was able to do almost all the activities, started his work also and did not, as I said, it is majority of time I had to convince him to do the follow-ups and MRI and everything because he personally did not have any complaint. So uh, that that's the uh, end of my talk about uh, osteochondral defect. And uh, 
now i invite a good friend of mine manit for his talk on micro fracture and micro drilling uh, i am uh, sorry interrupting you krunal are we discussing the things at the end of the whole talk or how we are going to plan the question and answers so we can do it both the ways as per your preference sir because what will happen that once you go through all the things and there will be clutter in the mind about the information about that talk so first question i would like to ask you is the what is your basic understanding about an aci particularly if you prefer to do in such a case which is non traumatic so what is your understanding of doing aci for a large defect like this what will be the ideal situation so this is the ideal situation honestly for the aci what all of us got the said implantation a uh, 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 defect of 4 in that is that, in that is one of dimension of the indication mm -hmm. but see in most of the patients like any activating factors in terms of, so one has to be very very clear about using aci even in the life in your criteria of doing aci in this patient what will take care so my i am always uh, 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 more conservative no, no 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 not apart from we have the first cell surgeon when you have you have more than 2 cm square or 4 cm square defect this was 4 by 3 as you said so that's one criteria indication which is good for aci it's a large defect weight bearing area but what would you assess in terms of the condition uh, of your subchondral bone what i can appreciate in regarding the subchondral bone there is definitely some sort of disease to bone and not a very uh, healthy bone as we see in the traumatic defects so the, of course but uh, that does not prevent me doing aci in this type of cases no. because there are the Well, see, also, so we've been I doing ACI for this defect, but the consensus world over is that if you have more than six mm of depth, if the lesion depth is more than six and six to seven mm, then you have to graft it, and then you can do ACI. So what you ended up doing was the right thing because you have osteochondral cigars or plugs, whatever you call it, that takes care of the diseased osteochondral whole junction, and subchondral bone is also replaced with the healthy bone. and that's why you are having a better result if you had just put in only aci on this defect it would have been maybe and the result so subchondral bone main take home message for this discussion that subchondral bone if you don't assess in terms of its metabolism its viability then we are going to have problem with any type of procedures so what you ended up doing because of the economic reasons maybe whatever single shot surgery you wanted to get back early because that's a protracted rehab in aci so that's why your patient did well because maybe whatever reason the oats was the right procedure for this kind of you know hard working yeah, guys it. yeah i guess so bone is the we are trauma or specific event where you can relate that as is because of trauma so that was one thing otherwise i think oats has been standing test of the time for specific indications where you are doing a proper job in the sense proper indication and it has to be open such a posteriorly going defect you cannot be surgeon this will be a youth thing so any anybody else joining in
they uh, they sit down and uh, stand up they always have this grunting type of sound yeah that will be incongruence there because you were going for eight mm graph yes. which is a big size yes but i think uh, if you started the passive range of motion early as you said third day you started range mm. so probably that will also heal up over a period of time and as you gain the quadriceps strength back in isometric range that is in tx probably over a period of time that should also go away not only in this case even in some of my other cases which i have uh, uh, had uh, opportunity to do follow up uh, after uh, uh, two years around because of some other reasons and i noticed them they did not complain anything but when i when i examined them what i noticed is they that is that, that it is not a normal patella femoral uh, a smooth uh, motion they do have some sort of clicking sound coming out from there Which, that's uh, uh, see most of the time it's related to the quadriceps imbalance which increases the pfj pressure and especially when you allow this people to squat as early as you said it's quite early in your case this is going to happen and that will lead to early chondral disease which is a secondary loss and once you have this type of procedure to do a quadriceps strengthening is a very very balancing act there is no general rule that you start open chain right away because open chain gives you more strength but at the cost of cartilage so as a individual sports persons and sports medicine practitioners we have to you know tailor make all your rehab individually and you need to teach your rehab guys that this is what is the safe range and this is where you want to work on because they are always smart enough in you know social media promotion and everything that we know this and that but they don't do anything so you have to tell them this is what a range i want this is a closed chain i want this is a open chain i want in all the respects we have to be very very thorough because these are not daily surgeries you don't do ots or aca every day and these are usually usually young patients so we have to be very very specific about our rehab advices and we have to supervise them and you will have scarring in that area even if you do arthroscopic biopsy for the aci because fat pad you have to dissect otherwise you cannot see and that's why i use now you know a 5 mm harvester we don't use the 7 i went to the literature and the experiences of some of the people which i yeah. met uh, even abroad who are doing quite a lot of cartilage yeah. surgery is the one they were telling me so, the 6 mm is max plugs which you should use yeah so e- even for the harvesting we use 5 mm one so you may take two plugs absolutely at the peripheral area so you will have less of this problem that's what may be a second take home message that you know yeah. 6 mm or maybe 5 to 6 mm harvest probably is yeah. the optimum and not yeah and you may have thing. yeah you may have more plugs okay yeah thank you anyone else in the crowd anybody has joined if they want have any questions for you just uh, you ask them there we i can see any questions on the chat box also neeraj if we can see we can ask or we should say we should uh, uh, switch over to the next talk by manit yeah go ahead so uh, manit is from mohali fortis and uh, a very good friend so i invite him for the next talk on microfracture thank you manit thank you uh, great thank you sir um i'll just bring up my screen So I'm talking on microfracture, and um, I thought I instead of presenting the old boring cases about microfracture, I would present something which is a bit more interesting, a bit more controversial. Uh, so this is a high-level athlete uh, who basically came to my boss when I was doing my fellowship. So he was a 28-year-old player. Um, he played for the Fremantle Dockers in the Australian Football League. He had a hyperextension knee injury while playing. The X-ray was pretty unremarkable; it didn't really show anything major. So this was his MRI. and i thought i'd just make it interactive so what's your diagnosis so let's just send it around the crowd and see what do you guys think is going on sorry everybody is muted let me unmute them wait hold on okay hello yeah dr kriya yeah. yeah so we can see we can notice some subchondral uh, signal changes in the bone and definitely some bone marrow changes also uh, not able to pick up the diagnosis though perfect 
it looks like more of a delamination type with a subchondral bone edema and injury as he was saying about hyperextension kind of injury right and what about the marrow changes upstairs yeah it is there that's unusual of this red marrow thing was something i don't know it, whether it is a red marrow it's a traumatic thing because he being a athlete uh, not able to pick up the Like so we we sent these films across to one of the best guys around for radiology, and he came back and said that there's osteochondral defect, obviously, and uh, maybe Song. Even though Song doesn't get used anymore, I know. So it's a BOML or a BMI, but um, that's what they were suspecting higher up in the femur that there was concomitant pathology. So he probably had weakening of the bone architecture, subchondral bone became fatigued, fractured in a way, and uh, ended up with this defect. So. the player and coach they basically wanted no time no waste they wanted him back asap it was a very high profile case out in the media everything the family was all about money 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 so the more time away from sport as you know the more money you lose um so we went in and we found this so there's a big defect there uh, in the cartilage so he had a good bump of bone along the sides some fraying uh, in fairly but generally a good wall for the defect so we decided you know controversially this could have gone out way as well but we decided to do a microfracture for simplicity uh, earlier rehab and get him back because of the demands of his sport to be back straight away so would you guys have done an outs in him yeah yes. see first of yeah first of all as you stated there was a problem with his subchondral bone as well as the epiphyseal area is at a epiphyseal metaphyseal bone it doesn't look that great so even though money 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 whatever the issue was as a clinician we need to basically have his bone metabolism checked before we offer him anything with a with whether he wants to get back early to the field and with a, this big defect the bone looks good subchondral bone so a micro fracture may be an escape button just to get him back and keep everybody happy but long term results may not be great on this see if we just put a brian college uh, uh prospective study uh, he had this our last year study and uh, quoted and uh, reviewed that uh, after 2 years they start deteriorating once we do micro fractures compared to what's an mci so yes. aci so probably uh, there is one of the concerns here when we offer him manufacture as anyone else and, and as you are saying is they are basically type one collision and microfracture what they find out in the histopathological examination so not exactly type two collision so that also is a concern for an athlete for a for a, for a professional athlete So he's 28 near the end of his playing career like a lot of other factors come into play here so usually these AFL guys they peak out at about 32 33 so he's basically got I know we talk about long term health of cartilage and all that but at that age in, in that sort of sport and with the external pressures that come on them they really only focus yeah, you know there's no with any international player just on playing they don't really care about the long term outcomes yeah means the and explain it to them but for them you know the most important thing is just play 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 yeah I means if that's the main context of the treatment then they come back come in from the ghettos and they go back to ghettos yeah. that's a very standard refrain right. in the western world so i would Because, probably an oats in this yeah Yeah, so I was just presenting it because it's controversial. So one of the things yeah, yeah. I wanted to show is the micro pick. So I've been using much and much more of this now in my practice, and I find okay. that it has some really good good results for micro fracturing, even for micro drilling, the three D micro drilling that we used to do before. So it works really yeah. well in those cases as well. So four years later, the me scores are great because he won a championship and he was one of the key players on the team to win a championship. So he's at thirty two, thirty three. Now he's about thirty four. He's still playing in the last legs of his season. So obviously his me scores are doing great, and he's come back. He's followed up. So I emailed my boss uh, before this, and he said that he's doing nicely. So of course there's horror stories as well of micro fracture. So if you know about Greg Orden, so Greg Orden was number one NBA draft pick. He was estimated to make about forty-five million US dollars per year. Potential All Star. The first season of his career, he had a big injury. He had he had a micro fracture which was done by my friend, and he was never the same. 
and now he's a no one in the NBA. So there's good sides and bad sides to microfracture, especially in the by elite athlete group and in that sporting environment. So as Sir was saying as well, that only sports or only money can't dictate outcomes. We have to also look at you know what the long term health is of these players. So uh, I just thought I'd run through microfracture in brief. So in 1959, Pretty basically described drill holes through the remaining cartilage into the subchondral bone. This was known as Pretty micro drilling, and it was really Stedman and colleagues out at Vale who introduced the true microfracture. So they removed the remaining cartilage base and directed drilling or holding or picking into the subchondral bone, bone. So they'd make multiple holes, one to two millimeters, three to five millimeters apart. And the whole principle was that as you borrow these holes into the subchondral bone, you're really stimulating that subchondral marrow. So you're allowing an escape vent for these uh, cells to come up to the surface, form a fibrin platelet clot, and hence transform into fibrocartilage. So the pluripotent bone marrow stem cells will come up. So you can see in the here, control versus the treated group. So it does lead to cartilage formation. And that's been, you know, theoretically proved and by clinically proved in multiple studies and histological analysis. So the hematoma comes up, forms a fibrin platelet clot, and you get healing by what's known as, as, as Dr. Cronall was saying, it's fiber cartilage. It's a very cartilage, which is never as good as a true cartilage. So the fibrochondrocytes, which are derivatives of those pluripotent stem cells, they deposit this type 1 collagen-rich fiber cartilage. And this is biomechanically inferior, and it's been proven by multiple studies. It's biomechanically inferior to the rich hyaline type 2 cartilage. It has a less yield to failure. There's a less yield point for the repair cartilage. And that's why the results of this have been traditionally good in the short term, but they've been very disappointing in the long term. So what is 21st century enhanced microfracture? So what are we doing different now as compared to what we were doing different about 10, 15 years ago? So now we're combining our microfracture techniques with the introduction of a thin layered blood absorbing matrix scaffold, which basically fills the defect. And this can be collagen type one, type three, or something like chitosan gel. Uh, even though any additional benefit of it hasn't been clinically supported. And in the initial studies, there was a relatively high biocompatibility failure of these implanted materials because they used to trigger an inflammatory response. So now what we're doing is trying to circumvent this problem and trying collagenous membranes. So they have good biocompatibility. You don't get that strong inflammatory response. And so there's things like autologous matrix induced chondrogenesis or AMIC for which RCTs are underway. Also under investigation is combining uh, microfractures with stem cells of growth factor therapies. And this is basically where the future for microfracture is heading. So we've trans, you know, we've moved across that era from in 1959 to 21st century enhanced microfracture techniques. Oops. Yep, so the indications and contraindications for microfracture. So a full thickness cartilage defects, unstable uh, overlying subchondral bone or a partial thickness. So age is a big determinant. So we see the best results, again, with the younger cohort. And it's theorized that they have more active stem cells to be able to transform into fibrochondrocytes. Uh, the size of the lesion also plays a big role. The smaller the lesion, the better the outcomes because it's able to contain that fibrin platelet clot better within the defect. But really what we know now is that the height of the cartilage surrounding the lesion has paramount importance. The bigger the wall around the lesion, the better you'll be able to contain the fibrin platelet clot, the better transformation that will happen to fiber cartilage, and hence the better results. So the contraindications are poor rehabbers, those with systemic arthritis or what we know as hostile knees, and those with malaligned knees. So if you're doing microfracture in a case of a malaligned knee without a corrective procedure, you're probably doing something wrong. So post-operatively, rehab is critical and paramount. So these are this is my rehab protocol, and this is the one that I've been following, and it and it works quite well. So we do cryotherapy day one uh, through to day five CPM for the patellar lesions. We usually limit it to about 50 degrees for the femur and tibial lesions up to 70 degrees. We do crutch-assisted touch weight bearing two weeks for patellar lesions and six to eight weeks for fem femur uh, tibial lesions. Patients are put into knee immobilizer two weeks again for the patellas uh, while they're touch weight bearing and six to eight weeks for the femur tibia ones. They're full weight bearing at about two weeks post patella and about six to eight weeks post femur tibia. Sports, we usually tell our patients that four months after a patella and six months after a femur tibia. 
and a functional knee brace we put them on for the femur tibial lesions from post of uh, second month to the post of fourth month. So what does the literature say? I'll just quickly run through this. So this, most of the work that's been done in this has been published in knee. So surgical treatment of cartilage defects. So this is a systematic review of randomized controlled trials, which was done by a very good friend of mine, Brian Devitt. So they looked at 10 trials and they basically found out that, you know, which lesions are amenable to ACI Mackey and which ones work better with Microfactor. So if you see that out of the 10 studies, there's only two, stu two studies that had better results with old than with Microfactor. So there's a microfracture for cartilage repair. This is another systematic review. It's more uh, up to date. It came out in 2019. And uh, it showed that micro microfracture provides good function and pain relief in the midterm as well. So we're moving beyond the area of uh, early term results. And this is the latest stuff that we've been doing. So enhanced microfracture with acellular scaffolds. So it does work well, uh, but there's a long way to go. So there's no really recommendation for this yet uh, in any of the societies, but this is sort of, you know, the thing that we're looking at when we talk about the future of um, dealing with microfracture and what 21st, microfracture, 21st century microfracture really involves. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience? I wanted, uh, what was in here a very nice presentation. So have you started doing any hybrid procedure with this microfracture in India back yeah, in so Mohali? What I do routinely, sir, is I do my microfracture and I combine it with tissue. So if there's a cartilage flap, so I, I'm more of a shoulder surgeon than a knee surgeon, to be honest. But okay. um, in, the, in the shoulder cases where we have vertical sort of cartilage flaps, what we do is the same thing that we do with hip scopes. So we okay. put a little bit of microfracture behind that cartilage defect, and then we'll use tissue and just glue that flap together. So I found that the outcomes are better with that than if you do just microfracture itself. So when we look at our constant and UCLA scores, they were trending better for the okay. tissue group than for the non-tissue group. And if, about... Uh, if, uh, if, uh, okay. if I share my experience with microfracture, uh, it is probably one of the most done surgeries in my hand. The reason being, uh, if we coincidentally find uh, Control lesions, specifically in acyl deficiency, there are also more of a not acute but subacute chronic cases. Then, along with the reconstruction, I usually add microfracture, and uh, they all do extremely well. I don't know the reason being just uh, uh, oh, that is the reason because biologically ACL and then probably uh, elevating the, 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 the etiology of control defect or along with that microfracture. But they all do extremely well in. Uh, isolated chondral le lesions, my experience of uh, doing microfactor has not been so well so far, but uh, uh, as you said rightly in our, uh, our country, sometimes it's just a, a sort of escape. Yeah. Now the issue is like in ACLR, you find them as a, you know, sometimes unwarranted defects, which you don't even anticipate pre-surgically most of the time. And they're usually smaller defects. And as you said, they are repeated micro or macro injuries and pivoting. So you have a pattern of loss, mainly on the medial, medial side, side, along with the medial meniscus flaps. So there, I think, a kind of delamination or smaller lesions, which are less than a centimeter or sometimes even 1.5, that is, I think, fair enough in young patients. And there, when you are not even anticipating that you are not maybe ready with oats or maybe you are not prepared for ACI in a higher class patients, you can always wait and watch and tell patient that this may be dealt in, if at all, we need to in a future date. But the primary issue is the instability. If so maybe you repair meniscus or excise, but mainly stabilize the joint. So I think that's a good procedure for most of the patients in trauma, because you don't have large traumatic OCDs or OCN in trauma. Like you have major osteochondral defect with ACL. I think most of the people don't have that. It's an isolated one which you saw, showed on the LFC. So I think osteochondral pathologies and traumatic lesions, they have some principally common base, but I think pathophysiology is different. The second scenario where I have been using this uh, microfracture as my weapon is uh, uh, the subpatellar, uh, I mean uh, the patellar chondral defects. 
because I'm not very comfortable doing votes and ACIs in that region, though people are doing it very efficiently with my hands, I'm not very comfortable. So there is a second See, scenario in which uh, I, I do use it often. Two different now. Yes. Patella, I think it's a very good indication in our country. And when you have a very large defect, especially in the dislocated or dislocating patellofemoral joint, ACI, we have done a couple of cases. But it's the challenge to get them back to the sports. Because the protocol, you cannot, you know, shite step or your short chat the protocol or rehab, and you cannot get them to. Just very good, right? So what's your opinion uh, for a microfracture in the, in the older sort of population? So between that 40, 50-ish age group? I, 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 in my initial days, I was quite, uh, I would not say very aggressive, but I was quite optimistic about those cases and had repented a lot doing uh, uh, microfractures above 40, 45 rather uh, cases. So probably these See, are the cases again, which any arthroscopy or any uh, salvaging procedure uh, though being done well, they don't give good results unless and until it has been done with alignment correction. If I do it with HTO, see, uh, see, probably again, base, uh, again, again, the main important thing is pathology. If it's an early gonarthrosis with chondral defect and the virus grade one or whatever, that's again what you're saying is right. But if it's a traumatic one, even in a 55, we did our, you know, the eldest patient like 63 i have done aci she had an absolutely pristine knee and mm -hmm. even at 63 we have done aci in mfc i was very skeptical because she was 63 mm -hmm. but it was a traumatic injury and she never had any knee pain we got the mri done even 3t mri we did alignment everything but otherwise beyond 50 you won't even think of doing any of things so Sorry, what you are saying? Manoj Bhai has a uh, has to mention something. Yes, Manoj Bhai. Yeah. So the question was, uh, microfracture is a very controversial topic as such, and uh, though practically we get uh, we are uh, we like microfracture because it's easy, practical. Uh, we can in, introduce the same procedure in our routine ACLs and uh, other procedures. But uh, the long-term uh, follow-up is important, which we uh, don't tend to do regularly with the microfracture. Yes. And uh, we had a long discussion with uh, Dr. Deepak Goyal also that uh, a lot of issues with microfracture in the longer term, and he has explained very well uh, why we get those issues. So like uh, getting those cart the, the bone islands and osteophytes uh, along with the cartilage causing the pain. Uh, so one of the discussion was the number of holes to be made for the microfracture. So I would, I would be asking Dr. Arora, uh, how many holes does he prefer to make at what distance and uh, what is the density of the uh, microfracture holes he makes? So, uh, sir, I usually just uh, follow what Stedman said. So one to two millimeters, three to five mm apart. And I try to cover the whole defect, but I make sure that the holes aren't overlapping or crossing or touching because what you're doing, if you're crossing the holes, you're basically creating a subarticular fracture. Yeah. So, so that's why I make sure that there's no stress rises. They're sufficiently spaced apart. I turn off the pump or I turn off the fluid and I make sure that there's some good uh, bleeding that's happening into the base. So that way I'm confident that once I let go of this knee or I let go of this shoulder, then it's going to feel nicely with a you know good fibrin rich platelet clot. And, um, but as you said, sir, the long-term outcomes is really, you know, the bad thing with microfracture. So we all do it for that short-term happiness, but it's long-term pain. The shoulder, it will be forgiving because it's a non-loading joint. Right. But in knees, we have to be very, very specific. And how do, how do you determine the depth of the hole in the microfracture when you do that? So when I'm using the hole or the micropic already has a set on it, so you can't go beyond that set. So the micropic uh, has its own depth built into it, so it just hits and blocks it. But so what do you like, yeah, yeah, because there are a lot of surgeons would prefer a K wire over a pick uh, uh, doing microfractures. Right. So what I think you know? that if you just break through, if you just break through that first four to five millimeters of bone, you're pretty much into that nice, rich, you know, that stem cell niche. So that's what all the histological studies now are focused on as well. The stem cell niches that exist uh, under that sub-articular space. So if you're creating a vascular channel or pocket into them, 
then the bone fragments will come up, they'll align with them, and they'll create a nice rich fibrin clot with these small, you know, bone marrow fragments in there. So I think that sets really nicely. And do you use a combination with the hyaluronic acid uh, in any cases? I did, I did, but I, I never really, I never really found that it had any clinical benefit. To be honest, like I used it, but the cases I felt that you know they weren't doing that much different to just doing a simple microfracture. What's your take on it? Have you had a different? Uh, no, not only a few cases, but I, I haven't studied them for a long time. That's why uh, it's a discussion whether we should incorporate. Uh, so this high, acid has its own half life anyway. So as as time goes by, it would anyways degrade. Yeah. Any input yeah, from uh, uh, Dhruvil Prathamish or uh, Sanjay Bhai regarding any of these two cases and any inputs you want to put at, uh, regarding these two cases? I think uh, for young patients, I prefer ACI, though it is a two stage. The next thing that I'm going to present is a one stage cartilage repair. So that is what I have started doing now for the young cases. Uh, as Nilesh sir uh, already mentioned that the long term result with microfracture is something which is a worrisome thing for us. The repairative tissue that actually generates on the cartilage defect with long, uh, in long time is the thing that we really want. It should be as normal as the native cartilage that the patient has. So the main focus of all the techniques that we are trying to do now is to have a reparative tissue which is matching the normal hiring cartilage of the individual. So uh, isolated microfracture in young age, I don't prefer. Maybe in old age with malalignment, so knee restoration is my practice these days. So malalignment is probably the only time I wouldn't do microfracture. So uh, Dr. Arora, in your case, the MRA was showing that subchondral fracture and uh, some fragmentation is probably a soft uh, base uh, or if it had used uh, uh, oats in that case was there a chance that it could have dipped in yeah so that was the reasoning so when we sat down and we'd gone through it one of the big reasoning that we had for avoiding oats was that we felt that once we sink in the graft it may just sink far too far into the bone because that whole shell behind it was so weak so we felt that if we hammer it and put it in it may just sink into the depth and actually be recessed below the surface. Once it's below the surface, it's equivalent to doing nothing. So probably I think that was the, uh, the philosophy behind using microfracture in that case. You see, the whole ball game is again going back to the subchondral bone. So if you don't assess the subchondral bone, any of these procedures are not going to give you what you wish. No, no, Nilesh, the issue here was it was a difficult decision. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw that uh, MRI and the subchondral bone beyond the area where he did the microfracture was maybe dicey. So, yeah, so as they said, we wanted a normal cartilage there. Yeah. The subchondral bone was not there to support our... Uh, yeah, yeah, this was just an escape treatment what they gave to the patient. He demanded, I, I need this, I want to get back to the field. So maybe a good case to present, but... Uh, I think uh, if you discuss it on the merits, not the right thing to do. So we can go with the next. So uh, I'll just introduce uh, Dr. Dhrumil. Uh, he's the uh, excellent uh, knee surgeon at uh, Madhutra. And um, I'd like to invite him uh, for the next talk, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Manit. Uh, Nilesh bhai, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So, because this is a case-based discussion, I'm going to present a case of an all autologous cartilage repair, which yeah. we perform these days in one stage for our patients with cartilage defect. This is a 21-year-old male with history of allergy to pain medications. He had a right knee twist injury due to a major fall from stairs on the 8th of November, 2019. He presents to me three weeks later with a knee which has pain scale 7 out of 10 and swelling. His main problem is he is unable to completely extend the knee. He has a fixed flexion deformity of around 30 degrees. The knee is otherwise stable and he has this problem in walking because he is not able to extend the knee completely. So that is his gait with a flexion knee. That is his standing x-ray of the right knee which is 
grossly unremarkable except for the effusion that we can see on the lateral view. His canogram right side doesn't show any major malalignment, though the normal left side does show varus. These are his MRI images three weeks post injury, and we can see that there is a full thickness cartilage defect in the medial femoral condyle. The coronal images confirm our diagnosis of a full thickness cartilage injury near the attachment of the PCL on the medial femoral condyle. That's the notch view for the knee, which shows that the cartilage is lying as a loose piece in the intercondylar notch. It has flipped almost 180 degrees from its site of origin. And this is what we get from the MRI, the dimensions of the cartilage loose body that is there in the notch. 21 millimeters in AP dimension, 23 in transverse, and 4 millimeters thick, which gives us a preoperative cartilage defect MADS score. MADS, by MADS, we mean uh, the area of the defect, the depth, and the underlying surface of the defect, which Nilesh Bhai has rightly mentioned. We need to see the subchondral bone. It gives us an MADS preoperative score of 50, which makes it a great three lesion. So I wanted to tell you this because for all grade three, grade four lesions on preoperative diagnosis on my MRI, I usually prefer a cell based therapy. These are the arthroscopic images of the patient where you can see that there is this flipped loose body in the intercondylar notch. So I removed the loose body from the knee because I did not think it would serve a purpose if you fix it back to the native site. And this is what we are left with on the medial femoral condyle. This big Of course, I never wanted to repair that loose body because it lost it, it lost entire attachment from the native bone. Uh, autographed oats, I think I saw presentation of Kunal Bhai and yes, it was a big defect for me to think about doing an oats because I am reluctant to get more than three uh, osteochondral cyl uh, cylinders from the non weight bearing portion of the trochlea. The center where I work in, I don't have easy access to allograft, so allograft oats was not an option. Two-stage ACI, yes, it was possible, but with prior discussion with the patient, we both agreed for a one-stage all autologous cartilage repair. And this is the technique which I'm going to present. This is the step one of the procedure where you harvest autologous cartilage from the non-weight bearing zone, the medial aspect, and the lateral aspect of the trochlea, as well as the notch. The important thing here is to have your shaver on the oscillating mode and to have a bone cutter shaver blade, which is usually not more than four millimeters in size. Another important aspect of this technique is to connect your shaver with a graft net device. This is marketed by Arthrex, and this graft net device has a receptacle which collects your cartilage from the knee joint. And when you open this graft net and on the kidney basin on the back table, you can get this kind of cartilage paste. In this case, because it was a big defect, we thought of mincing the original cartilage loose body that we removed with the help of an 11 number blade into small cartilage pieces like this. And then this entire cartilage was hydrated with one cc of platelet rich plasma and it was filled into a syringe, five cc or 10 cc as per your preference, attached to 18 gauge or a 16 gauge needle. This was injected under direct vision into the knee joint like this. The left side shows the preparation of the cartilage defect. The middle image shows injection of the cartilage paste. And the third image is when you try to spread the entire cartilage. Now the important aspect is, how do you want to fix this? And that is where we use natural fibrin glue from the patient's whole blood. We prepare autologous thrombin serum with a thrombinator system that you can see on the left side of the image. And this autologous thrombin serum is filled into a dual syringe that we can see on the right. It's injected in point with platelet-rich plasma and forms a fibrin glue in 15 to 20 seconds. So that is how you inject the natural thrombin serum with the PRP into the knee joint onto the defect and on the right side is the final arthroscopic image of the procedure that we do. So I'm going to present a short video technique 
of how we do it the first thing is obviously preparation of the cartilage defect and as manit rightly pointed out we use a chondral pick it creates less heat generation and there is a depth stop so you cannot penetrate more than 3 or 4 mm you want to have a good stable bone marrow cells at the base of the cartilage the next step is to have an accessory high medial portal where i park my laboratory spatula or a thin osteotope into the medial gutter after which you want to remove all the blood and the water from the knee joint because the next steps are going to be under dry arthroscopy we have to be gentle when we do this and then for the cartilage defect we use sterile cotton buds to dry out the base of the cartilage defect after which with the help of a 16 gauge needle we inject the cartilage paste which is hydrated with platelet rich plasma onto the defect and we know as dr nilesh mentioned that to get the right trajectory into the knee joint while doing an arthroscopic procedure is very difficult and that is why the role of this laboratory spatula or a thin osteotome is important here where you want to use it to spread the entire paste nicely slowly and maybe uniformly over the cartilage defect we as trauma surgeons sometimes find it difficult to have the patience for this but yes i think this is the step which requires a lot of patience and once you are sure that you have been able to spread the cartilage paste properly over the defect that is when you want to inject the fibrin loop to stabilize the paste onto the defect so that is the activated thrombin serum with the platelet rich plasma which usually sets in 20 seconds after you inject it into the knee joint and again you can use the spatula to you know spread the paste of cartilage with the glue onto the defect the rehab well manith has very nicely mentioned what rehab he follows and that is the same for all the cartilage procedures that we do in our clinic non weight bearing for six weeks is something which is very important and we start cpm mobilization from the second or the third post operative day based on the comfort of the patient this of course is his six months follow up these patients do better even at in the early post op phase almost three months they have no pain because of the surgery and he has good quad strength of course with half squats and full squats that he does in his gym that we allow usually after 3 months the only thing that we restrict is sports for most of these patients impact sports is something that i am not confident for these patients to pursue early so we wait for maybe 15 to 16 months before they go back to sports his knee score 6 months post op was 1 which was pre operative was 7 and the post op score was 1 that's his post operative mri i think clinically most of our patients do good but i think it is very important to see on post operative MR mris the quality of the repair tissue that is there at the cartilage defect site for all the effort that we put in and that you can see on the mri the coronal images that it has good cartilage healing at the defect there is some subchondral bony edema that we can see and this sagittal post operative mri image also shows good intake good uptake of the cartilage cells that we put over there there is some surface irregularity but that is less than 50% of the entire cartilage defect this post op radiology again is something which is important to the patients and we are two score for these patients for this patient it was more than 70 which is comparable to the other cell based therapies that we do in conclusion what i want to convey through this case is that we can do a one stage procedure when it comes to cell based therapy because we are using autologous cartilage cells from the patient uh, patient same knee uh, i would prefer this procedure in younger patients only because they have a good regenerative potential for the reparative cartilage tissue over the defect short term and medium term results for all the autologous minced cartilage doing and of course this is economical as compared to the two stage aci that we do or the allograft oats that most of us don't do in india and i got can you can always do it as an open procedure if needed so there is no compulsion to do it arthroscopic thank you
good presentation good thank you thank you very much in fact uh, you need a good uh, procedure i'm sure there will be questions so i would like to ask you one first question uh, any role of using co2 inflator in when you do this cartilage uh, uh, in co2 inflator I, which I, endoscopic people use i've been in uk they used to do this quite a lot this dry procedures cartilage procedures in fibrin u and all those and it helps a lot uh, to inflate the joint and make it more comfortable because all these endoscopic procedures endoscopic ot setups they do have this thing it just need to detach the the, the water in the saline inflow and attach the co2 inflator just asking whether there is an experience it's, it's a good suggestion for a dry scope yeah which they use it for the laparoscopy so for lap they use the co2 inflator so particularly when you are implanting if you want to have a clearer or little better hemostasis i think a co2 in sufflator or that generator can be utilized but we orthopedic guys i think we are very skeptical about using which you don't use it every day so yes, yes. for ankle implantation of aci we cut off the fluid and you will have little bit of oozing here and there so you could insert your shaver with the suction on and try to dry it up or maybe as you showed that you use that cotton bud to take away the blood so you try to be you know time conscious and how fast you can implant it and since this lesion was fairly in the frontal plane the arthroscopic procedure was absolutely called for but if it was a deeper lesion underneath on the central and posterior area probably arthroscopy would have been a challenge especially in a stable joint Yeah. So, uh, when we are using a muscleized cartilage, which is similar to the technique uh, which is used by Dr. Kevin Stone since many many years, we also had a big piece of uh, acute, uh, acutely fractured condyle piece. Wouldn't it be better to fix that piece back rather than uh, rather than using the muscleized cartilage in this? Because the, most of the cartilage was used for on the piece. So I have what was coming from the. i had the same question so i have i have an experience of using uh, uh headless cannulated peach screw for fixing the cartilage defect and this was a young patient with a 3 week old injury my only concern was that this was a flipped piece of cartilage that was lying unstable inside the knee joint since 3 weeks i was not sure about the viability of that cartilage piece it was just 4 mm thick and when you try to fix a 4 mm thick cartilage back to the bone how much are you going to sink in the headless screw is a big issue for us uh, sometimes you end up you know making the screws proud just to, so that you have a better stability of the fixation and I, i was worried that if the superficial layer of the cartilage goes away then those screws are you know inside the joint and that might damage the cartilage so just because it was a 4 mm thick cartilage loose body i was not sure of fixing it i have had an experience with a patient where i have fixed him with Screws and then I have to remove it at two months just because the superficial layer just got worn out with his uh, knee flexion and extension movement. That was the main yeah. reason why I used this. The, the reason for this is that if you see the physiology of cartilage, cartilage, uh, as we know that it's supposed to have a very uh, weak healing potential. The reason is because there is a progressive death of the cells. When one cartilage is injured, there is a progressive death of surrounding cells. So whenever you muscleize the cartilage, probably you are going to induce a lot of damage to the uh, the viable cartilage. Yes. So and we also cause irregularity in the surface, which was a smooth, nice cartilage. Third thing, whenever you see a cartilage at three weeks time, uh, a four millimeter thick cartilage, it is quite rubbery and easily sutureable. So you don't need to use screws until unless you have a bone sliver of bone there. Okay. So, looking to even, uh, even things, Arthrex and some of the other companies. There are people that are doing of the uh, cartilage piece there, and okay. you have even a Arthrex natural cartilage. Some other companies have uh, this radiolucent biodegradable K wires also, which I have used so many of times with uh, uh, with a uh, fiber wire or something to tie up the piece, specifically on the under surface of patella, though. But even See, can be used. Uh, I so think, the, uh, yeah, quite. So Manoj, quite. Yeah, yeah, technically you have done an excellent job. I will say that it's commendable. Only thing is our uh, discussion of is for the physiology. Yes. 
See, it actually still, uh, I'm not convinced with uh, what they're promoting. It's a single shot surgery, but probably what you're getting the result is because of the microfracture and the PRP and, you know, all the biofactors which are helping the lesion too. And particularly in this case, it was a partially non weight bearing lesion into the notch, medial wall of the MFC and partly going into the medial femoral condyle. So probably this will be fine because this was the right case for this kind of new procedures which we want to use and try to see whether it works. But physiologically so, what Manoj so is it, saying. If it was on a patella or a trochlea, I wouldn't do this. I would go for a two-stage ACI. Because, or if it was on a, a bigger lesion on a weight bearing, uh, more weight yeah. bearing zone of the femur, I would go for Obvious. a four. Obviously. So yes, this yes. particular selection was good, I think. And probably you will uh, not face any music or the patient won't face any music because yes. this is going to do well. But uh, see, again, a morselized cartilage implanted in the same stage, whether it will become a highline type 1 cartilage, I'm still not convinced. We'll see and wait for the further studies. I think we are going to do a rescopy on him after one year and see how it yes. goes, maybe. So yeah, yeah. I would suggest if you do a rescope, you should take a small piece for biopsy and then we should yeah. check. Okay. That would be nice. So, we move uh, on to the if next. If there are no questions, then probably we move on to the next uh, uh, talk by uh, Manoj Bhai regarding the patellar control defect simplicity for difficult situations. Dr. Manoj. Yes, sir. Can you see my screen, please? Yes. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Arthrex and Ortho TV for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to present here. They have given me a topic which is one of the most difficult subjects <laughs> and asked me to simplify it. Yeah, it's, it's a situation. It's like, <laughs> it's like a cool <laughs> situation. So, uh, let me try my best. So first thing, what scared me was talking about this bone, patella. And this small little patella, which everybody knows is a sesamoid, a large sesamoid bone lying in the extensor mechanism uh, of the leg. It has a very, very complex bowel mechanics for which we can talk probably for days together. But we know that it uh, controls our cordyceps mechanism. It helps in the open chain function and also in the, uh, the closed chain function. It has a property of shock absorption when you are doing this squatting, running, jumping, all those activities. It has a very important uh, function of stabilization. The important uh, word says stable because if you see the figure on the right side, that's the angle of the, the direction of pull on the patella. And uh, we are, uh, we, that patella needs to stabilize in all moments. And a lot of force being applied to the patella, which is almost seven times the body weight. And, and a very great shear force, which is much greater than the tibiofemoral joint uh, shear force. And still, patella works for years together beautifully. So, let us try to understand with a case. Uh, this first case uh, is a very dear friend, an orthopedic surgeon, and this young gentleman. He likes to do a lot of sports because uh, he wants to lose his weight, but he's very strong. And he did his regular gym exercises. So one fine day, he has his acute pain in his knee with a sudden popping sound, a lot of swelling in the knee, and he was not able to walk. So he got worried and he got his x-ray done. His x-ray showed a flake of bones. So he got worried. The second thing what he did was he went for a CT and MRI. So this CT showed a flake of bone lying there. So as a trauma surgeon would immediately think, okay, let's find out where it's coming from. So he got his MRI done. And that's the MRI picture. And you can see very nicely, there is a loss of cartilage on the patella on the middle facet. That piece lying in the lateral gutter, uh, coming from that uh, uh, defect of the patella, lot of blood and effusion there, a tear in the, uh, the middle uh, ligament of the patella, and probably a trochlear dysplasia kind of flattening seen on the trochlea. So 
now he comes to me with this picture and I have this multiple options in my mind. So I, I put this question to you, what would be your choice? The panel here, whether we put a, a simple brace in extension and uh, do nothing, we do an arthroscopic removal of these loose fragments, uh, what, uh, uh, or some, we do a removal of loose fragments and do some ligament reconstruction, or we fix a fragment back and do a ligament reconstruction, or we do a fixation fragment uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, be able to just repair. So a lot of options. So what would be your choice? Kunal Bhai, uh, Dr. Kunal? Uh, I, I would uh, uh, fix the fragment. I would fix the fragment. Uh, and uh, would you touch the MPFL or do nothing for that? See, I'm not very good in repairing these ligaments in first say. So I would do a reconstruction of the MPFL and that I've done both the things in single stage in some of the cases because I was not very sure whether this is going to recur or I was not very sure whether I would be doing a good repair. So in that case scenario, I have done both the things together in some of the cases, but I cannot justify that. So I was quite reluctant saying the reconstruction part. So with his age of 42, still would fix the fragment and reconstruct the MPFL, right? Uh, any other, Dr. Manit, Dr. Nilesh Bhai, Dr. Basic, Basically, the trihypotenuse it's an avulsion from the patella side, usually that defect on the medial side. So, if you have a good enough osteochondral piece, probably you can repair it along with the primary repair and refixation with whatever suture material you think you are comfortable with. But uh, if you have to lose, if you have to remove it, Probably I would not go in with an MPFL reconstruction on the first set. I will let that as a second stage, as a formal MPFL reconstruction. Because MPFL per se is a very small, ill-defined structure which cannot be primarily repaired properly. But if you are able to do the fixation, fixation of fragment with the MPFL, then I think that's the best case scenario. And uh, Dr. But, so I'll do a fixation of fragment with MPFL repair. Yeah, that's the way if it's an acute one-off big piece. But MPFL reconstruction on day one of the primary event, I think it's a little too much. Any other? Okay. So that this I had discussed, discussed before with another group. And uh, one of the consensus was that this is a beetle first set uh, cartilage. So we can remove and throw it off. In the, it's not going to hamper much with the function at 42. And uh, when you are doing it, you can also repair the MPFL in the same setting. So there's another way of uh, doing it. Now, yeah. so what I did, so I did an arthroscopy for this patient, uh, for him. And uh, let me show you. This is a very, very old video. Yeah. So you can see there's a uh, defect in the patella. Yeah. And when you see inside the joint, so it's a big that piece. Was a big piece. So yeah. this was a very big piece, more than 2.5 centimeters by 2 centimeters, uh, quite thick. And he also had a good amount of cancellous bone on the undersurface, and luckily it was not fragmented. Yes. So Sorry, this is what I got on the table. Was there any subluxation of patella? Must be. Yeah. Yeah, this was a dislocation patella case. No, no, in, during the arthroscopic view, uh, we, uh, was it subluxation no, no, no. or something? It, it was quite a review. Yeah, it was, there was a lateral laxity, uh, but it was not dislocating. It was subluxated mildly, but very easily reducible. And it was an acute yeah. case. Now, okay. I'll tell you the patient himself is an orthopedic surgeon, so, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, game changes. Uh, we are doing at the earlier, very early stage. So immediately uh, on table, we decided that, okay, this fragment I'm going to fix. And I discussed with them that, okay, we will try fixation because that time, again, we, we did not have many cases of fixation of Padlet at his age. And it, I was not sure whether this works or not. So mini orthodromy was done in the same sitting. This, uh, I could fix the fragment nicely. And as Drumina said that the headless screws don't hold much, but luckily, I was able to put one or two screws here and fixed with a lot of uh, vitriol on the edges and got a very good, unlucky, I don't have the pictures here, but uh, we got an almost 90% uh, coverage of the defect. 
Now, what happens whenever you remove a piece of cartilage, such a uh, cartilage from the joint, it doesn't fit the greater. Hello, uh, webinar channel. It opens up. So we need to do a little trimming, little pressure, and only then we can fix the car, this fragment back. But that was done, and MPFL was reconstructed on table. Again, uh, I my uh, mentality was to repair, but uh, after discussion, it was decided that we should reconstruct. We should not take any chance for the uh, repair. And uh, with the semi-T, uh, uh, with a double tunnel, with a double fixation of the patella and single tunnel on the tibia, uh, femur, femur. Uh, the femur, yeah. where this was done. The reconstruction was done. And five years down the line. This gentleman still heavy, but able to do this. So uh, this has actually uh, enforced my belief that cartilage uh, does heal very well, though it looks very uh, bad and the age is not a criteria. Um, in, I don't have the pictures, but and repeat MRI was done after two and a half years, and the cartilage was sitting very nicely there, and symptomatic function is doing very well. So. Uh, here is a stable uh, knee and a good cartilage on the middle facet now. So this is a way of thinking about the patella. But now let us decide. Uh, let us discuss what can happen wrong with the patellar cartilage. So when you're talking about injury, it can be a direct trauma, it can be a patellar dislocation, or it can be a maltracking. So direct trauma can happen to the patella with a dashboard kind of injury or a fall on the flex knee. This is a typical central injury on the patel or the patellar cartilage or on the inferior pole. There is a second entity called the patellar dislocation, which we saw just now, when the patella jumps out laterally, uh, and that time it drops on the lateral femoral condyle. So it causes injury on the middle facet of the patella, very typically, either it gets abraded or the whole cartilage may come off, which was seen in this uh, case. There is also in the MRI. Uh, uh, the bone marrow edema seen on the lateral femoral condyle edges, which is typical of a dislocation of the patella. And that's the, the sorry, yeah. yeah, that is the hill sex of the knee, yeah, exactly. So, perfect. That's a, I will I'll remember the analogy, yeah. And the third thing is the mal tracking, uh, which is uh, which can happen because of the mal alignment, the rotational mal alignment, or the valgus of the knee, or problem with the foot or the hips. So, a lot of things can cause mal tracking of the knee. So now, now my question is, what kind, what pattern of patients uh, do they come to your OPD? The direct trauma, patellar dislocation, what, which is the maximum number of cases coming from? Usually the patellar dislocations with this type of, okay. what you presented, this very typical of the dislocation with the medial side lesions, either on the odd facets or the superior medial, medial facet, which is, you know, because of the pull of and this MPFL. So usually in this area, you know, what you showed and what you showed was a great technique and probably everything healed well. But otherwise, this part of the patella is a quite forgiving part. If so, even if it was sacrificed, a smaller piece, this would have still done well as far as your joint is stable, your patellofemoral joint is stable. Okay. So I, I will um, I'll give my... Uh, uh, thinking over this uh, why i did the fixation if you yeah. see the mri we'll show the mri once more that cartilage defect is very big sticking off yeah, yeah. almost the whole middle facet and also uh, going up to the median ridge yeah, yeah. so this important. was a right right case for what you did but most of the patients which i have encountered are exactly. much smaller defects i agree so I I, uh, I already disclosed my I, I agreement with you doing the same type of procedure. So don't disagree. But I also agree with Nilesh Bhai's uh, view that uh, many a times I see this type of uh, patellar marking or chronic dislocation in which I do arthroscopic evaluation also before doing MPFL reconstruction. And what I can see is there is some older condor lesion on the medial sided facet which has which is which there is a sort of a very good fibrocartilage form yes, without yes. doing anything and there is that fibrocartilage yeah. is exactly what has been seen in most of the chondral books post result yeah. okay, that this should be like this so exactly. it, it's forgiving also but i would have uh, done the same procedure uh, probably in acute case scenario so the difference here kunal is the 
the whatever you see in the mpfl cases yeah this is not because of the pressure we welcome the all to because of the lot of public session so uh, this uh, cartilage injury is happening because whenever the patella is dislocating or subluxing laterally it is shearing on the lateral femoral condyle yeah. but it is not a pressure injury yeah. uh, the right. third group here shown here is the mal tracking this is where the pressure is coming on the lateral femoral condyle that's why i said if the patient has a di direct trauma you have a central injury if it's a patellar dislocation it's a medial facet injury and if it's a mal tracking it's a lateral facet injury because mal tracking means the extra pressure is going is on the lateral facet it is lps lateral hyperpressure yes. exactly so that's the reason we are treating all this uh, at it is in a different way but uh, what a differ with uh, nilesh bhai is that we have a very big number of patients coming to us as undiagnosed anterior knee pain yeah and a lot of this they fall into that third group of mal tracking yes. yes yes so every time we diagnose them as cmp or chondromalacia patelli but actually this is the pfps syndrome or the patellofemoral stress exactly syndrome. it is hyperpressure and lateral hyperpressure yes. and what we are missing because we don't give enough examination time for the femoral torsions for the for the gait for their foot for the hallux valgus for their hip strength we are not seeing and examining all these things and that's the reason we are not able to pick up and treat that third group which is a very important group and, and we we must uh, look what you are saying is a very right thing and most from 80 90% of the patients are in this group exactly and that's so, the reason uh, we, uh, the henry and david dejo is probably has published uh, max in, in regarding this case scenario or chondromal we call it chondromalacia or pfps i think in his his first two chapters what he has mentioned is that this is a different nomenclature but they all fo uh, fall into the same category of anterior knee pain and uh, uh, previous to uh, visit to him i used to give them rest and press and whatever but what is the treatment now that they the leo group suggest is uh, a very aggressive quadriceps and hamstring uh, strengthening protocols uh, uh, doing squats lunges leg presses in the gym and and i have seen in my experience that these are these females of middle aged or whatever they actually recover well so but you are, again you have to basically identify what manoj is saying the, whether it's a dynamic mal tracking there are the issues with the soft tissue the muscles the tightness is the bony malalignment all this once you figure that out then only your rehab is going to work okay. so dinesh bhai is saying exactly that the customized rehab is important and you have to tailor make yes and so what happens for example patient has a foot problem you you might need a foot orthosis to correct the flat foot and that would correct yeah. your knee problem if the patient has a hip problem use uh, uh, stick to the physiotherapy for the gluteal strengthening to improve yeah. the external rotator strength of the hip if you have problem with the uh, patella vmo weakness uh, then you go for a vmo strengthening sometimes the vmo may be strong but the vmo and the vl are not firing in uh, in tandem then you to you to correct the biomechanics of the vmo vl firing so yes that is important okay. and again here we have to assess the hamstrings hamstrings because hamstrings overload it band it overload these are the very important thing which increases the pf pressure so if you do not uh, release those things and continue to do only strengthening it may be counterproductive yes so sometimes you find the patients worsening after your physiotherapy because we are not taken uh, into uh, account about the tight structures like tight knee or the lateral tendinopathy or yeah. the you have the gastrocoelous tightness yeah so this can also hamper with the knee function yes and the flexion deformities yes okay. so that is Nine. the reason so uh, one very important way of treating the chondral injury in simple way is just observation and physiotherapy in a proper yeah. way and sometimes orthosis and other than doing some complex surgery yeah we have to involve ourselves yes. in all these patients so now yeah. uh, under understanding this spectrum we have either physiotherapy and orthosis a cartilage restoration procedure which we discussed in uh, the further, future uh, in the pre lectures and the bony correction or surgery so suppose if somebody wants to go for like if you done a physiotherapy uh, cartilage restoration if required and what we can do for the surgical correction of the uh, for the pain so we have options like trochlear plastic which dr prasun is going to talk about 
we have an AMZ procedure or an endometrialization procedure for the tibial tubercle or a tibial uh, tubercle osteotomy for the pater uh, realignment or a distal femoral osteotomy or a uh, proximal femoral osteotomy for the torsions or we have uh, PCL reconstruction. We should never forget for the anterior knee pain. So lots of procedure can be incorporated for preventing the cartilage loss or just um, adding to the cartilage repair. But only PCL reconstruction when you have a BCL deficient knee, yeah? Yes. Only <laughs> I am talking as a spectrum because we have very limited time millage guys. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Just want to come finish the list, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, we should understand the location of the lesion, very important, and then decide upon the type of procedure we need to work upon. And uh, very important is uh, this message of the median reach uh, because Niemeyer uh, had described uh, something like a double eye technique. So when you're doing a big lesion in the patella, and if you are not looking at, uh, not uh, looking at preserving the median reach, what will happen? This uh, this is going to fail because that's the area which takes maximum load in stabilization yeah. of the patella. True. So after all these options, we need to decide what is simple and best for us. So for me, it is a physiotherapy bracing. Try to repair even the. Physiology back, and only then we develop upon the complex procedures for the cartilage and the bone. Uh, some doctor, uh, Doctor uh, George Muzopoulos, had tried to, with this uh, Seabold. Uh, they had a paper, very complex algorithm for the different pain. But if you see all the papers after this with this complex uh, procedures, the results are not really good. The reason is because very ill understanding about the bowel mechanics of the patellar femoral joint. Uh, one question always arises in mind suppose if i'm going to realign my patella in the instability can i prevent the loss so for that you need to understand the type of dysplasia which kind of continued procedure you are going to do mm -hmm. and the choice of restoration because if you make a mistake here this these are not going to work and now with the fresh uh, input of the papers it was 17 this paper uh, very uh, successfully says that they could send all the patients with the autologous uh, this osteochondral transplantation back to sports in six months. So this is that uh, light at the end of the tunnel. So probably with our better understanding of this biomechanics and this surgeries, well, we, are, uh, we are looking at much more. Call mom. I okay. am ready now. Nice, excellent. Any other questions to Manoj? I think uh, for the paucity of time, we move on to the, I think, last uh, presentation from Pratnesh. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Manoj. Excellent discussion and excellent talk. Yes, Pratmesh. Uh, sir, can yeah. you see the uh, slides? Yes, yes. So, we'll just be talking about arthroscopic to trochleoplasty. I'll just give a brief overview regarding patella instability. So, patella instability is basically uh, affected by predominantly uh, bony factors, which are trochlear dysplasia, which can be seen in up to 96% of the patient, abnormal patella height, and pathological TTTG distance in this order of frequency and patella tilt can also be an associated factor. There can be secondary factors like virus valgus, genu verdicabretum, torsion, patella dysplasia and abnormal subtalar pronation. Now there is a there is a Dijord classification which classifies the uh, trochlear dysplasia into four types. Type A being most, min, uh, most mild uh, to type B, type C and then type D. Uh, the type uh, normal trochlea is a, a sort of a uh, uh, can be of either a shallow or a flat or a convex trochlea. It can have a double control sign. So as we see, type A, type B, type C, and type D. Type B and type D have a supratrochlea kind of a spur, and you have a crossing sign in type uh, A, B, C, and D. So crossing sign can be seen in up to 96% of the patients. A shallow trochlear depth is seen in up to 85% of patients 
and it is pathologically if the 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 uh, uh, the uh, trochlear depth is less than 4 mm there can be a trochlear bump which is seen in up to 66% of patients and it is pathologic and it is significant if it is more than 3 mm this does not mean that we need to do a trochloplasty if it is more than 3 mm i'll come to the indications of trochloplasty later on and then you can have a double contour sign and trochlear bead now this is a lorenz view lorenz view is basically axial at 20 degrees which can actually give you an idea about the patellar tilt and then you can calculate the lateral patellofemoral angle now this is a small algorithm that we usually follow if the patient has a minimal bony changes that is a type a or c trochlea with less than 20 mm of tttg distance and less than 1.2 mm of catan jishams that is there is no patella alta then you can just do a soft tissue procedure like mpfl reconstruction and go away with that but if you have a tttg distance which is more than 20 mm ideally a tibial tubercle osteotomy uh, should be added if the, there is a type b and type d trochlea that is you, need, you have a supratrochlear spur and specifically if you have a supratrochlear spur which is more than 5 mm then a sul sulcus uh, deepening trochloplasty is warranted and if you do a trochloplasty in these patients you can do it up to tttg of 24 mm because when you do a trochloplasty the tttg distance will actually decrease so if it is a very severe trochlear dysplasia with a tttg more than 24 mm which is a very very rare uh, occurrence then you may need to do a trochloplasty along with a, a, a tibial tubercle osteotomy and if you have a significant patella alta you may have to add a distalization now we'll come to indications of trochloplasty trochloplasty is a advanced surgery with the limited indications as of now uh, the major uh, indication is you should have a uh, prominence the, the supratrochlear spur should be more than 5 mm this is a important indications as per uh, different studies you you can do it in advanced uh, dysplasias like uh, dysplasias b c and d uh, the apprehension should not only be in extension but also in flexion so you, you should have an uh, apprehension in a flexion of about 0 to 50 uh, 50 degrees the trochlear inclination should be less than 11 degrees and you should not have cartilage changes you should not have contal changes on the trochlea so that the contal changes on the trochlea should be less than icrs grade 2 now if we talk about the uh, trochloplasty the trochloplasty started with lb's elevation trochloplasty this was the first this was a elevation trochloplasty and then there was there was deepening trochloplasty which was described and then there was a recession uh, uh, trochloplasty which was uh, recession wedge trochloplasty which was described which actually remove a portion of the uh, wedge of the bone while doing it and then dijo described what is called as a sulcus deepening trochloplasty in which he removed a triangular piece of the uh, bone at the at the uh, trochlear sulcus and then just push the cartilage down uh, this is an example of the sulcus de uh, open sulcus de deepening chondroplasty so open trochloplasty is quite a uh, successful pro procedure in these limited indications that i have told so this is this is how it looks and usually we put two to uh, one or two central uh, suture anchors and then we'll use a vicral uh, sutures to use a knotless one two and three uh, sutures to actually compress the uh, patellar condyle flaps so it's a very very successful procedure but it has a common uh, very common complication of post op arthrofibrosis so in different surgeries different uh, surgeries the post op arthrofibrosis can be seen in about 2 to 42% of these patients and this is a very good prospective study which shows that uh, uh, a manipulation under anesthesia is usually not a uh, adequate procedure in those patients with arthrofibrosis following a sulcus deepening or uh, trochloplasty and most or most of these patients in this in his series it was about 25% of the patients needed a a uh, post operative matlab second stage uh, arthroscopic training of good range of motion so post of arthrofibrosis is a concern in uh, this open trochloplasty group so to prevent these uh, problems of uh, uh, arthrofibrosis uh, there is a technique which is an arthroscopic trochloplasty i'll just present the case so she was a young 32 year old lady and uh, she had an episodes of patella dislocation and uh, she had a trochlear uh, dysplasia the patella was uh, dislocated both in extension and also in flexion so even in flexion the patella was uh, dislocated laterally 
so it was a significant uh, trochlear dysplasia almost convex type d and uh, it was associated with a significant patella tilt and dislocation of the patella also in the flexion so around up to 70 to 80 degrees now when she is walking you can see that uh, the patella is tilting on the left side you can see the patella is subluxating when when, when she is walking and she has a significant apprehension in walking as this was her axis uh, there was a significant uh, uh, supratrochlear spur uh, the patella was hypoplastic the uh, dimensions of patella was really less uh, the caton dishon's ratio was slightly high it was uh, 1.32 it was not very significant but slightly high and uh, this is a uh, mri pictures and now the recent studies shows that trochlear dysplasia should be uh, graded according to the mri so if you see here uh, we, we can see that there is a significant convex trochlea uh, there is uh, trochlear damage uh, condral damage on the patella but not that much condral damage on the uh, trochlea itself the spur is prominent you can see that there is a significant facet asymmetry the trochlea is not very well much visible and there is a significant uh, decrease in lateral trochlear inclination now we what we use the ideal fixation which is uh, historically described are staples and headless screws but now we are using knotless anchors with uh, vicral sutures normally we recommend a push lock anchor you we use normally send once uh, one anchor in the center and use two to three peripheral anchor in a knotless uh, pattern so this is the initial uh, we do it in a supine position and this is the uh, initial pictures that we saw we did we do a removal of the supratrochlear bump or supratrochlear spur from the superior lateral portal and we just then put the grafts now the whole uh, procedure is to shift the trochlear groove laterally and to decrease the tttg distance uh, along with the deepening of the groove so this is and the this is the pre and the post op pictures if you see this is the pre and post op pictures now this is a small video clip in which i'll just show you how we how we will elevate the flap this is a tds procedure so now we are looking at the uh, uh, from the superior medial portal and uh, here we can see that this is the uh, medial patella femoral ligament which is uh, which is very weak here now we'll insert the passport cannula and we'll release or uh, remove the synovium from the top of the uh, trochlea and so we'll remove the uh, synovium from the top of the trochlea in a nice way uh, because th this is the area where there is a extra bone and so when you see here at present there is you cannot see any formal trochlea at present so you this is a, almost like a convex kind of a trochlea and then we have this is the patella if you see upwards that is a patella and there is a some you can see some trochlea uh, some cartilage damage or the fissuring type to kind of a damage on the patella side if you see here and then is the, at this point of the time we will mark up our uh, uh, now we use two burrs here we are using the smaller burr to just mark the level of the resection initially so we'll just mark the level of the resection initially like this and we'll go from lateral to the medial aspect of the patella so the trochlear gro uh, trochlear groove is prepared we'll remove a lot of bone in the center because we want to we want to just uh, do a more and more uh, resection on the under surface so this is a small this is a 2.5 mm bar and this bar is used just to create the level of the resection and once we are able to create the uh, a good level of the resection we know that where, from where to where we have to do the resection and then we will switch on to a larger burr and we'll go and we'll keep on elevating the flap as such and we'll gradually deepen it to the level of the trochlea so we'll go from the lateral side and go up to the medial side uh this is a tds procedure and this takes takes time you have to be patient in doing this procedure you should not hurry because we don't want to fracture the flap so we'll go it go very slowly in this particular area so we'll resect it and we should be sure that the flap that we made and then we can use a small chisel or osteotome 
to make the final uh, elevation of the flap so this the final medial aspect of the flap can be elevated with an osteotome and then we will resect the center more on the center so then we'll resect more tissue on the medial aspect so we'll just use our uh, burr more and resect more bone on the trochlea so we'll keep on resecting more bone and now if you see that now there is a good trochlear uh, trochlea that you can see so previously we were, you were not able to see that trochlear groove and once we resect this flap then we we'll go when we go up you can see a good uh, trochlear flap so if you see from here so when we release a good amount of bone you will be able to see a good trochlear flap and then the rest of the procedure is simple we just have to put the push lock anchors so here when what we see is we can just see that there is a good trochlear groove which has formed if you elevate a good flap and then you can just use one or two, one anchor here and then use the in a knotless fashion two to three anchors to just compress it in a lateral pattern now this is usually this procedure usually is not uh, uh, useful alone so we combine it with an mpfl reconstruction uh, in this particular case we use gracilis and we we did a no uh, we didn't use any holes on the patella but the patella was hypoplastic so we uh, uh, did, uh, did a technique which called as a MPO, mqfl reconstruction so we pass the uh, the gracilis tendon through the quadriceps tendon and if you are doing any open procedure you can do a lateral retinocular lengthening in this particular case we didn't do any lengthening and this is actually the final appearance of the uh, groove thank you this is a procedure that i have done recently so i didn't have a follow up i just did, i did this procedure just before the lockdown and as per the telephonic uh, co uh, conversation with the patient the patient has have, having full range of motion and does not have any uh, problems as of now uh, thank you thank you dr prathmesh it was indeed a wonderful presentation and but very skillful surgery so i'm not sure uh, how much of uh, the panel uh, the 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 speakers would be would have experience regarding this but definitely a wonderful procedure question here dr prathmesh yes uh, sir the the last picture which you showed was showing a vitreal tape yes sir this is this is not my pic not my not my picture sir okay because it's this, not available uh, because that that's what yes, we are yes. using for we are using number 2 vitreal we are using a number 2 vitreal for this particular procedure right. we are using a push lock suture anchors with number 2 vitreal and uh, the question was because um, uh, the our main worry is to get that optimum level of bone below the cartilage so what you uh, shown here was very nice thin flap and at the end very nicely closed so uh, do you think it's easy to do it without a zig the one which is being marketed by arthrex uh, uh, yes sir i think i think zig is not that much useful if you can elevate the uh, elevate the flap nicely with a bar uh the jig is not very much useful you need to have a thin sliver of uh, cartilage and the bone which you can elevate uh, from underneath the cartilage so the jig is not very much useful but definitely the, this uh, these unique knotless implants are definitely uh, useful yeah, so the main advantage of zig what we find is that it will not allow breaking of the because it of the bridge control. so we are not going to injure the cartilage we don't we don't go too deep so can we do it uh, without zig that easily uh, without breaking the cartilage yes sir yes sir yes it, it it takes some time so that's why i'm telling you that you need to be patient in doing this step the elevation of the flap is the most difficult step and you should spend time and go do it uh, very meticulously great very nice uh, uh, uh one question is uh, other than this particular case uh, in your previous experience specifically for a non athletic uh, community uh, uh, what is your experience of you would have done a uh, isolated mpfl reconstruction in this type of cases are there any recurrences uh, yes sir my personal experience of mpfl uh, reconstruction is i i am i, I am I, they, the results are good the results are not excellent is if specifically the patient has bony abnormalities like patella alta trochlear dysplasia or increased ttg so th then the results are good they are not excellent with a solitary uh, mpfl reconstruction so by uh, not being good you mean recurrence or pain or what exactly how you evaluate uh, your bad results both both so uh, so the patients who are not happy uh, 
some of them do have a, a sort of a tightness in their knee some of them them may have a crepitus and uh, occasionally one or two patients have also complain of a recurrent uh, subluxation kind of a picture so so solitary mpfl reconstruction in cases which have a, a bony abnormalities i am little bit reluctant in doing so if the tttg is more than 20 and if it is a significant trochlear dysplasia like type c or d uh, with a convex kind of a trochlea i am i am skeptical in doing a, a mpfl reconstruction alone so uh, basically it being an evidence based medicine i i i wholeheartedly support this thing that uh, you need to first address the bony abnormalities than only doing a soft tissue yes. procedure like yes. mpfl but at but if we talk about the practical experience specifically in our country without any sports involvement uh, somehow uh, the results are not that bad at been has been documented in uh, literature but i do support the evidences yes of course a lot yes, of this is with uh, the trochlear dysplasia uh, would have a uh, elongate uh, base uh, abnormal catenitions uh, and a very low yes, central alta so yes, do you sir. combine them uh, along with this uh, tto's dissection uh, i have not i have not done so far sir but it can be yes ideally it can be so as as this uh, algorithm goes if you have a tttg of more than 20 24 Uh, you can do a uh, both. Uh, you can do a trochloeplasty along with a TTTG uh, tibial no, tuberosity no. transfer. I'm talking about the distillation because. Ah, uh, so you can you can combine you can combine it with the uh, trochloeplasty. Yes, sir. Uh, In some cases, you can if you have a patellar alter, I have, have not done it so far. Trochlear dysplasia surgery, trochloeplasty. Then the problem is uh, again the biomarkers are still not uh, uh, restored in those cases. But then it would be yes, very so difficult. If, if, I yes, think some of makes... the distalization also been taken care by trochloeplasty itself probably. No, no, no. Uh, distalization cannot be taken. Distalization take fill uh, this trochloeplasty take care of the medial lateral part. Yes. It will not take care about the alta as such. It will reduce the TTTG so, but not reduce that. So uh, it will reduce little bit of TTTG. Yes. So, so it will not reduce the, alta. Yeah. So one of the technical difficulties in doing trochloeplasty is breaking that flap to get yes. the shape back. Yes. Which is a very difficult. the thing actually that's the reason dijur yes. always cuts the uh, uh, the cartilage yes. in the center with the knife yes yes so i think uh, that was a wonderful discussion and a, a variety of bunches of cases and uh, with that probably we can uh, with the permission of the pa the panelist uh, dr nilesh bhai uh, can we end this session and uh, thank our uh, uh, dignified faculties uh, uh, yeah. our uh, faculty from mohali dr manit arora uh, yes. dr manoj bhai uh, dr dhrumil from baroda and uh, prathmesh from uh, ahmedabad and of course nilesh bhai and sanjay bhai from ahmedabad so thanks thank a lot you very much thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you